up? I'm Dave Chappelle. That's Maya DiGiorgio. This is Sinbad, I'm gonna tell you. My girl, Maya DiGiorgio, she is funny. I mean, really funny. This girl right here is certified funny. She's fantastic. Give her all your love, man. I love her to death. From Manhattan, Maya, ladies and gentlemen. How are you feeling being off the road? Are you, is this a good time for you? I think it's no different than the athletes when, they were, when the NBA said we're going to be in the bubble, we're going to go play. Mm -hmm. um, at first it was real strange. At first it was like, I mean, I, well, first I took it as, well, I, I can get a rest. I've, I've, been, I've never stopped going since 83. Mm. You know what happens? My whole fit theory of life is, what if this is as good as it gets? Everybody's waiting for the next thing. What if, it, what if the next thing doesn't come? Mm -hmm. What if this is as good as it gets? What if this, what do I do with it? Mm -hmm. you know, what do we do with it? What if like, wow, my career is messed up. Okay, what if no one's going to give you a deal? What if no one is going to hire you? What do I do? You got, you got to take charge. Were you, did you always want to be a comedian? Was there something else you did first? As a kid, I want to be everything. I want to be a boxer. I want to be Mary Andretti. I want to be a pro basketball player. I want to be a, a, a walk on the moon. I want to be Buzz Aldrin. I want to be, uh, I want to be everything. I had no limits. I didn't know, because in the 60s and 70s, there was no HBO. Dude, my, my imagination was like some cartoon. Man, we, like, I'm going to have a house with a swimming pool that I get out of the bed and I jump in my swimming pool and I swim downstairs and I get something to eat. My brother, you stole my idea. I'm going to have a swimming pool. You can swim in from upstairs. Okay, I just have my swimming pool downstairs. Your swimming pool go upstairs, but my swimming pool be downstairs. So, you know, we... we we would fight about a dream. I fought my brother because he was going to buy the same Corvette as me. I'm 13. <laughs> we were, it was six of us, four boys. So it was, my father was always positive. My father was my chili, my mother and my father, because I, I sucked at sports. I was always late growing into something. It was always a little bit behind. He mm -hmm. said, man, your time's going to come. I always tell people, when he told me, your, your gift is persistence. And I was like, what the, what kind of superpower? Who is, who is persistent man? He just gets beat down and beat down. Then one day he just stayed. Persistent man just never gave up and he won because everybody else got tired. But as I got older and I read all the positive thinking books, I said, wow, that is the gift, the one who can stay the course. Mm. Who's the one that can stay the course when everybody's laughing at him? Who's the one that can stay the course when nobody believes him? I said, you can, after a while you don't hear the noise anymore. You can't afford the luxury of a negative thought because a negative thought will overtake. See, you know, people say light overcomes darkness. No, all you need is just a little bit of darkness and you can jack up all the light in the room. You ever been in a conversation and, and, and working on the idea of Maya and mm -hmm. somebody comes in, now I don't know if we can get the money for that. Everybody goes like, yeah, you're probably right. Because one person can kill everybody's spirit. One person can destroy a group of 30. Yeah, no, I've experienced that in, in, in uh, this business completely. And when I've really yeah. learned uh, to now keep uh, positive people in my camp and yeah. the thought, especially the new thought of a, of a new idea um, that you have to, you have to shield that and, and, uh -huh. nerd, and you have to be very cautious of uh, being able to read people's energy, uh, of, yeah. you know, switching on you, you know? So um, were you originally a Californian? Did you, were you out here? Where? Nah. Born and raised in Michigan. I'm kind of ashamed now with all the stupidness going on in Michigan, marching <laughs> on the Capitol with guns. We have Michigan people with Confederate flags. Are you dummy? A Confederate flag, are you dumb? <laughs> uh, we're not even in the South, stupid. South Michigan? Southern Michigan? Is that where you're from? So I'm like... <laughs> but did, were, you were in the military. Is that how you left Michigan? Yeah. By uh, joining the military? And well, what? I went to college first. I went to the University of Denver to play basketball. So I was at first, college first. Uh, Dropped out with, with my grand, threw my books up in the air my senior year and said, I'm out, but I had nowhere to go. So <laughs> I, I, I made this move, but once you make the move in front of everybody, I'm like, I should have made the move when I had a place to go. So <laughs> I, I, there was a place on campus called the Black House, you know, the Black Student Union? Yes. I knew, I knew where the key was. Okay. Oh, okay. So I moved into the Black House because <laughs> I had to get all my stuff out the dorm. They put me out the dorm. So I, had, I found this little big old piece of plywood some wheels on it i put all the stuff on it and i had it around my, my, my back and i pulled the stuff down the alley to the black house so i get to the black house 
And I'm hiding out in the black house trying to figure out, man, I'm going to keep working out. I'm going to go play pro basketball overseas. Because every overseas team could take two guys. There was a place called the Surrey Privates out of London. I said, I'm going to play with them. I met, I met the, uh, the, uh, the scout. So I'm going to work out. But my knee, my knee was almost shot then. Okay. And I was in denial like a mother. But I'm like, I'm going to play overseas. And I got somebody look at me. And my boy, I'm not going to drop his name because that's my boy, man. He went to try out for the, the Dallas Cowboys. He's a basketball player, just cut up. Well, he didn't make it. I, I, he comes back. He's in the black house with me. I'm like, what's up, man? Yeah, man. I think I'm going to do like you, just hang here. I said, no, man, this works because I'm here by myself. I, I know how to do this. This I know how to keep the lights out. I, we got busted. Okay. Because the guy that ran the black house came in. Have you been staying here? I said, man, can I just talk to you? Black man, black man, the, the black house should be helping black people. Man, he called security. <laughs> I said, Plus, he never liked me anyway. I used to mess with him, so I earned. Like, I take I take the hit for everything I earn. Mm. I take the hit for everything and my anger and my craziness and my young and my youth. I take a hit for all that. And um, mm. it's almost like God put all these obstacles. I said, what? I said, what? So now I'm furious, right? So I figured, no, no, I'll play with the Harlem Globetrotters. Look, I'm a good ball player, but ain't nobody funnier than me. Ain't nobody funnier than me. So I wrote a letter to him. I was the next Metal Lark Lemon. I can play basketball. And they said, well, you know, we, we need guys who can go to pro life. That's me. I said, that's me. They called my coach, Mike Good. Yeah, I said your name. They called my coach, uh, Mike Good. And uh, man, Told him I was a. They told him I was a drug addict. What? Yeah, he got me. I never got high. Never drank. Got me. Wow. Got me. Next thing I know, they weren't talking to me anymore because they were really high on me. And then that's when I just I lost my mind. I ain't. I got anger. I got anger. I got angry. I bought a five pound bag of sugar. I said I gotta go home. I bought a five pound bag of sugar and dumped it in the in the gas tank of his Volkswagen. Yeah, that was me. So now you know who did it. So yeah, put a five pound bag of sugar in this car. Wow, confessions from Sinbad. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So then from, so then where did you, where did you go from there? Like how? I was, supposed to, I was supposed to go to Boise, Idaho to get my brother's car. Okay. And drive it back, drive it back to, to Michigan. I catch a bus from Denver to Boise and my dad's like this. Man, what are you doing? I said, I don't know, I'll figure it out. I get my brother's car and get in a car accident within the first four blocks. I, I get in a car crash. When I got out the car in Boise, all these white people come out. He did it. I'll stand here as a witness. <laughs> I said, I'm not, I'm not going nowhere. What'd you say? I said, you know, I'm that kind of brother that will go to prison today. Say something else to me. Mm. So they all gathered around me, but I don't know why. The police officer showed up and said, what happened? I said, I got a car accident. I hit this cat. I, 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 I missed the light. He says, I don't, he goes, I don't need the rest of you standing around. Oh. We thought he was going to run. I said, and like, yeah, you can stop me. I said, you're 95 years old. How are you going to stop me from running? So I'm going off on this old guy. And, and I'll never forget this cop, man. He's old, maybe only five, you know, five years younger than me. When you're young, it seems like a lot. He goes, look, man, your mouth can either get you in trouble or out of trouble. You seem to have the gift of gab. And I, and I, and I calmed down because I calmed down. I said, yeah, man. I said, he gonna live long anyway. He goes, he said, there you go. <laughs> See, he said, there you go. I said, he gonna live long anyway, so he might die before we got out of this conversation. Mm. And okay, what'd you say? I said, and he's deaf too, so I can say anything. So he says, hey man, we'll get your car towed somewhere. So I had to catch a bus. So I rode a bus from uh, Boise, Idaho, all the way back to Michigan. Gave me time to think and kind of get my head together. So I, I get home, I get home to Michigan and uh, I don't take a shower. Two weeks, three weeks, I'm staying in the basement of my parents' house. And I said, forget the man. I don't care, I don't care. I ain't doing nothing. In fact, I'm becoming a gangster. I said, I gotta be a intelligent gangster. I said, yeah, I'm gonna do something. And so my dad came down in the basement and I thought, we about to go at it, you know? Mm -hmm. And he messed me up. He gave me that responsibility speech. He said, look here, man, let's blame everybody for everything that happened in your life. Let's blame them all. If you fail from this point forward, that's your fault and they win and your college coach wins, and they all win. Because they don't care if you fail. Matter of fact, they see you as a failure. I was like, and he went upstairs. 
And so I ended up in the Air Force and got kicked out the Air Force. But it was the Air Force talent show. The Air Force talent show changed my life. Really? Changed my life. Tops and Blue. They actually, if you look them up, they performed at Super Bowls. They performed for Kings. Tops and Blue was a performing arts branch of the military. You wore a jumpsuit and a dicky. Oh, come on, man. Women <laughs> love that. A flight suit with a dicky. Come on. Come on, man. You can't tell me nothing. Did you wear one for the talent show? Uh, no, for the talent show, you, you had to win to get to that. So I entered in the, the uh, MC category and the comedy category. I'm going to win both these categories, double my chances. God sent people my way, and, and, and my boy Jim, man. Jim was a guy, was a, was a staff sergeant, man. He might have been a tech sergeant, who is uh, Pat, no, Pat Tuttle, who gave me my first joke. A joke, I mean, written out joke. Mm -hmm. He said, close with this joke, man. He had thousands, close with this joke, man. This joke will kill for you. I said, all right, man. So I'm memorizing the joke. I got stuff written on paper. Here comes the comedy category. I didn't know how to do stand-up. So I created a character. Remember the group Devo? Mm -hmm. I painted my face silver. I had a mixing bowl over my head that I spray painted. I had a jumpsuit on. So I looked like one of the people from Devo. I had a microphone that ran up under my jumpsuit. I was tech back then. You can't tell me nothing. <laughs> I went out there and started talking 100 miles an hour while Devo was playing. And the longer I went, I said, God, please let this stop. Please let this stop. Please, God. <laughs> Please make me disappear. God, please turn the lights out in this building so I can leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> my, Salem said, well, we know we didn't do well in the comedy category, did we? <laughs> I came in last place in the comedy category and I was the only one in it. Oh, I didn't get enough points to beat me. I didn't have enough points to go forward and I was the only one in it. That's how much the judge, they gave me negative points. That's so crazy. So now <laughs> the last thing I do is I get to MC, there's two MCs competing. He did the first half and the MC brought me up. So he saw me get about the MC. Man, I hope you do just what you did with comedy. I used to think he was funny, man. All right, MC, get my notes. John Stanley said, hey man, let me see your notes. He ripped them all up and threw them in the trash. I said, what are you doing? He says, Sinbad, you know how you sit around and talk crazy with us? I just want you to talk crazy for the next hour. Mm. I said, what do you mean? He said, man, talk about that thing that happened on base today. I walked out, introduced the category, and I did little stories, made up stories in between, and then people said, people would give me stories. Oh, Sinbad, can you do something like this? And I would go out and just do these little stories, and then I ended with the joke from Pat Tuttle. I got a stand ovation from my officers that hated me. For, people forgot for a second that they hated me. And I got a stand ovation. And that's where my comedy, that's where my style, my style came from. That MC category, we took my notes and threw them away. And I became that dude. I went to, I went to command level. So I get there, we perform. I was the only one from my base to win. I, I got perfect scores. Wow. So now I'm going to Barksdale Air Force Base down Louisiana, outside New Orleans. Ooh, ooh, ooh. They had to uh, put us together, you know, to room with different people. Bobby, man, and I think Bobby passed away. Bobby was a dancer. This boy, this boy could go, about yeah. six for go, but he was gay. And none of the soldiers wanted to room with him. Mm. When he danced with two other girls, I'm like, he's gay. He don't want them. I can have them to myself. <laughs> So I said, I'll room with you. So man, I'm rooming with him. We're talking, man. Uh, me and him are friends. I'm, I'm talking to the girls that dance. And then I said, look, man, I got to do something different. So Willie, Willie the Wiz, what have always, he always won all the MC categories. He always won every year. They said, hey, man, you're going to be Willie. Willie's, Willie's legendary. Okay. Well, Willie the Wiz said, man, you got to have a costume, man. You got to find your thing. Somebody, your name is Sinbad. So, so we, we went to, to uh, New Orleans. And Willie had the Willie the Wiz, he had a, like from the Wiz, he had like an outfit, like a genie, the Wiz. I said, ooh, 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 I said, I'm gonna do that. It was a Playboy Buddy costume. He said, no, man, no, you can't do that. I said, yeah, I'm gonna do Playboy Bunny costume. He goes, you know, I, I seen brought you here, bro. <laughs> bro, what the hell are you doing? I seen brought you here. We get back, 
I try on the costume in in, in, in my in my room, and Bobby goes, "Man, your, your butt cheeks are hanging out, man." I said, "Yeah, this is a little tight." He said, "I got some tights you can wear." So he gave me a pair of dance tights <laughs> to put on, to put under my Playboy Bunny outfit. So the night I'm supposed to host, uh, they said, "Man, he ain't gonna wear that." Everybody said in the audience like this, "He ain't gonna put that Playboy Bunny costume on." Jim is my man who is still my cat. Jim was the guy who puts all the stuff together and tours and make everybody happen. But I'm standing there in the Playboy Bunny costume and goes, brother, I don't think I told you to put that on though, did I? <laughs> I said, no, Willie said I needed an outfit. And he says, bro, he said that to you to make you lose. I said, oh, he wants me to lose? I thought Willie was my friend. <laughs> Well, I walked out there with that Playboy Bunny costume and I talked about what it was like to be the only male Playboy Bunny working in Chicago. I couldn't make no tips and, and, and the abuse I took as, as a male Playboy Bunny. This is the first, the, um, I just the first act I did. Name the act, Yeah. category, did my Playboy Bunny thing, name the act. I came off stage and Jim did this. He said, could you do me a favor? Could you put some clothes on now for the rest of the show? <laughs> So, so I took the outfit off yeah. and put on some clothes. Great night. I kill. Uh, the guy who runs it is, 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 is Tom. Tom Edwards goes like this. Look, kid. And I heard he was hard. Tom wore them glasses. Look here, man. I've never done this. I don't care if you win this competition or not. I'm taking you. I never, I've been waiting for a kid like you for a long time. Wow. How long was it, was it for you when you were doing comedy before you booked A Different World? I started comedy in what, 80, 83 maybe? I, I got first, to LA. Was that your first uh, big appearance or did you have Star No, I came, I came out, when I first got out to LA, I did Star Search. Okay. That, that was the thing. That, that was the thing that propelled me and people recognized me and I said, ooh, I like this. I said, I think I'll move to LA now. That's wild. So then, so but, you, you went, you, you did your Star Search. Mm-hmm. And and you came close. I was in the finals. I won like eight, nine, ten times, maybe eleven. And then I in the finals, and I'm against John Casier. You can never beat a sock puppet. That damn little puppet. Oh, oh, my pretty. Oh, oh, what you say? What, what, what? Oh, you can't say that. I, I lost. I lost it for about a month. I carried. I carried. A ventriloquist dummy on the road with me and a puppet. No, you and I was sit on, I was sitting on stage. Hey man, how you doing? I don't care, really, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you lost that. I'm glad you shedded that. You were talking we were talking about a different world. Now, how did you land that? Would you you landed that in New York? Did you come to New okay, York? Okay, different world. Different world is look, they're looking, they're they're just they're doing the spinoff. I'm like, I got me cosmic. I got, oh, oh, they're doing this spinoff called Different World. I told my manager, he said, well, you, know, you, 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 can't, you can't get on that. I said, okay, they need a comic to warm up the studio audience. So they were having auditions for comedians to warm up the studio audience. I said, that's going to be my way in. I'm going to be so funny. They're going to put me on the show. Wow. So I'm warming up the audience. And at, at the end of the second night, man, I'm like this. If nothing else happened, I met Bill Cosby. He yeah. grabs the mic for me and says, this man should be on TV. And I was like this. Well, you know, you, you can put me on. I did my <laughs> ventriloquist act. You know, you can put me on. <laughs> it just came out. It was, you know, you can put me on. He said, boy, he hand me the mic. I said, cool. Well, I didn't give my address. I didn't give nothing. I got a ticket to go do the Cosby show at my house two days later. Wow. I showed up my wife, I said, I'm doing the Cosby show. I didn't give my address, I said, that's kind of creepy. Should I be scary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when Hollywood calls, they call. Yeah, yeah. Goodness. And that's how the world, that's how that world opened up. No, you definitely have been uh, such a, a great inspiration and and um, and a trailblazer uh, of 
for me, it's like, you're the comedian who's, who's been the most honest and supportive of people that I've seen and not hating on people, but just bringing so much love to everybody that you meet and inspiring them to keep fighting forward. So I'm just so grateful for your time and 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 all that you do for not only comedy, but bringing people together. Because you, you're also ta- taught me to be a better version of myself on that mic too. So I'm- always, always push. Like I said, you know, my thing is push. Yes. Your reach should always be longer than your grasp. you like, did I leave some food on the table? Did I leave some money on the table? Think about it. Comedy's like stripping. If I'd done one more twerk, could I made twenty more dollars? <laughs> did I leave a twerk behind? Did I leave? Did I leave one twerk? Did I leave a twerk out? Thank you so much again for your time. Leave room for the magic. I always say. And then when you put it all out there, if you can conceive of doing it, you didn't push it far enough. You need something that's so big, like man, I don't know how that's gonna happen. It's got to be so big. I'm gonna get this. I already tell people I'm getting Netflix special. Have they called you? No, I don't think they know me. And I'm on 15 million. <laughs> I'm on 15 million. I'm not going for less. I'm not doing less for what everybody else was doing. Or it's gonna come from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I don't know where it's gonna come from. I don't even know who is gonna bring it to me. But someone is. That's not my job. My job is to be ready. That's what an assassin does. He sits home. He cleans his guns. He works out. So when he gets the Manila envelope. Okay, time to go kill him. <laughs> you can't be out of shape and get the middle of the envelope. Oh man, oh, I wasn't ready this week. Oh man, I ain't got no bullets. Oh, I'm gonna have to turn this job down. My family's calling me now to come into the TV. All right, thank you so much for <laughs> Thank you. All right. And always have on my back, thank you.